Good morning. I certainly hope this can be trimmed from any video recording display. Mm. Morning, Mark. Okay. Good morning. Look, humans. <clears throat> humans. Good morning. Good morning, humans. How are you? Good. How's Good the man. business of being human today? As fine as humanly possible. Really? Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> it's my favorite occupation. Yeah. You know, I'm into it myself. It's, yeah, it's, been, it's turned out all right. It's a question of measurement, I find. Like, more human and less human. There are times. Mm -hmm. I think it's a question of magnetism. Hi, Who are drawing to me? Hi. Yeah. And, and like what circles you wrote, sort of revolve in and all that and. Makes a big difference. Yeah. 
and pandemic has been weird that way because on in the one hand we're all trapped we're all prisoners of zoom but that gives us insane flexibility for who we associate with when how whatever travel is just not an act not actually even an issue uh et cetera, et cetera. so you know you might know. be traveling back to portland in december yay oh and i met bz yesterday you did yes we had coffee together oh how wonderful how, yeah. how did that go bz petrov she's delightful isn't she she's delightful works at, for everybody else she works at the archive um and does human resources and used to be in animation movies all that kind of stuff um so we had a great conversation about pixar and a bunch of other good things oh yeah she's absolutely wonderful she is one of the more human as opposed to less human humans <laughs> we like more human we like more human but maybe not in the sense of h plus or whatever i didn't watch that whole series but there was a really good series about enhanced humans i think called h plus um on you visible on youtube in short segments um i'll i'm gonna have to start finding resources um but i didn't watch enough of it but uh Dwayne hendricks said you've got to watch this you got to watch this because all about human augmentation a little bit like altered carbon but without all the fiction plot and everything else more toward what reality might be like there's a humanityplus.org um but i think whenever you get a humanity plus you tend to get humanity minus i don't know how that can be is it a package well you know it's i love what ken homer says about inclusion um in in hr and then basically you know every human has equal dignity and when you come with inclusion exclusion it, it's uh it's still a sorting it's still a selection process we have to select people for hr you know um uh but you know I'd poke at the conceptual defaults when we make distinctions um are we being in our minds sort of supportive of biases and prejudices or kind of um you know trying to in some way be more human have a more human perspective um and this is something I don't know. It's kind of a, a passionate confusion to, to try and ask these questions. Um, one of the eight superpowers in April's new book is called Be All the More Human. April's book, by the way, is going crazy. Wow, she is just having success after success. Really exciting stuff. It's on fire. It's on yeah. fire. She, she put in an enormous amount of work um including including spending like a couple of weeks cleaning her emails and moving them to mailchimp and a whole bunch of really manual stuff that only she could kind of do uh you know there's a couple of programs you can run your mailing list through that'll say these are probably spam addresses and these are probably like broken but then you've got to sort of sit and look at everybody to figure out who you're going to send to hey i've got i've written a book note too so she did that which like it was just sort of hard uh, but then uh, a whole bunch of other things happening and it's like it's a dream rollout, so it's working really, really well. And here's, uh, let me just type in the seventh superpower summary into our chat. Aren't there eight? Yes, but the seventh one, uh, the one I'm just bringing uh -huh. into this conversation is oh. be all the more human, which looks like that. Okay. There we go. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, Grace. Nice to see you. Um, I, I just want to say last week's conversation about the metaverse here was special. It was really cool. Um, uh, it didn't start as a weaving the world conversation, but I'd like to make it a weaving the world conversation and package it as such. So expect that to sort of turn into something uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, and uh, yeah, the last couple of mornings we've had uh, sort of OGM uh, ops uh, sorry, OG, build OGM call on Tuesday, weaving the world ops uh, yesterday. And every one of those conversations has kind of evolved and uh, improved the, the idea of what on earth are we doing here and how does weaving the world fit with the common artifacts we're building and all that. And the strange thing that happens is that 
when we're rolling and when the conversation is hot is when we have the best ideas. And then like, they're hard to paint when you just walk into the room. You're like, oh, okay, got to work up that excitement again, or got to got to paint the mutual picture again, in, in some sense. So, so we're getting there. Uh, uh, and Mark, it's uh, Flux by this woman, April Rennie, who happens to be my better half. Um, yeah, and uh, let me just give you a link to, uh, let me add a link to the eight flux superpowers in my brain so that you can wander around what I know about the book. I've also been keeping a clipping file for her. So that's a, that's a link to the eight flux superpowers. And then if you nose around to the book, you'll under the book, you'll see a flux clippings and she's been getting all sorts of press and all, and all of that. So I, I, I keep links to it there. I don't have all of them, but the, the, but the majority of them, uh, she's written and posted a bunch of pieces. I've got those in a separate place. Uh, and, uh, all of that is in, in context in some sense. Um, any thoughts before we sort of launch into a little round of, of check-ins? Or any questions about um, last week's call? Uh, any, I'd love any comments about the alternating between topic and check-in rhythm for these Thursday calls. Like, is that working okay? Uh, should we change it? What do you think? all is good in the world is that the new uh the new way that sounds really interesting to me i like that actually yeah that's our that's our present format we've uh we're busy what we're doing is we're using the mattermost chat for this channel for the ogm calls to pick a topic for the next week uh, except last time wendy mclean basically said hey let's talk about the metaverse and we're like okay good <laughs> because Facebook just came out with their announcement and it's a hot topic. And we had a really interesting start of a conversation um, that we want to sort of build on a, a bit as well. But so, so kind of an open question right now is what should next Thursday's call be? Uh, and then we're going to stick with the check-in uh, process for the alternating calls, because that's kind of how we figure out who's here and what we're working on. Hey, Gil. Hey, Michael. Thank you. Any other thoughts on process or where we are? What struck me is that the the two ty types of meetings were not as different as I expected. Uh huh. Um, well, my my approach toward the check ins is whenever somebody says something that's kind of juicy to just like open it up and see what's on the table and and sometimes <clears throat> we'll spend twenty minutes in that topic and and sort of still going and then we'll kind of work our way slowly back to the check ins. So those those portions of our check ins. Are, are very Salani or, or something like that, where we're, we sort of head that direction. So that's true. Any other observations? Cool. Um, how about we go um, Mark, Stacy, Doug? Um, I'm not sure I have that much to say. Um, the uh, 10th annual future of text conference is uh tomorrow 7 a.m pacific time and saturday um two in the morning pacific time plus um seven in the morning pacific time they kind of split it for i guess asian um uh folk to be able to uh connect um frode hagland has been around uh gosh i first encountered him in like 2005. Um, he's a designer and uh, he's getting his PhD, I think, at the Open University. Um, but basically, he's gathering all kinds of people who are incredibly interested in um, language. And um, he's created a number of different tools, uh, organized a number of different uh, uh, very innovative um, software. Uh, situations and um i i highly suggest it um let's see and uh yeah i'll, I'll just pass on anything else at the moment um do you want to give us a taste for the conversation or the topic future of text is interesting broadly but i think it gets really specific and so forth you'll notice also i've put froda in uh potential ogm co-conspirators which is a hidden thought in mm -hmm. my brain but these are people who are doing really really interesting work that i who i haven't approached uh, about joining here and probably should, but uh, can you give us just a taste for what, what was up? Oh boy, well, 
Um, pretty much all of the conferences are on YouTube. Um, he also has a YouTube channel called Augmented Text, I believe, where um, he has Monday and Friday open office hours um, uh, Vince and monthly office off open office hours. Vince Cerf and uh, uh, Bob Horn and um, a number of different people uh, show up. Um, let's see. Boy, um, the future of text goes from... Is the future uh, of text bright or dark? It's... <laughs> It's without, without bright and dark, you can't yeah. read text. You have to have that contrast. Oh, darn it. Okay, so good point. Good point. <laughs> contrast is important. Yeah, um, uh, foreground and background. Um, so uh, I would foreground diversity of people who show up and talk. Um, uh, they're kind of like lightning talks. Um, 10 minutes of talking, five minutes of questions. So there's a bunch of different people. Um, the book... Uh, the Future of Text um, has been uh, out and it's downloadable for free. Um, and there's dozens of different uh, luminaries uh, talking about the future of text. He didn't uh, get enough contributors for a second edition. So they're kind of just extending it by mm -hmm. bit by bit. Um, and, you know, I would basically say uh, diversity. Um, I, I don't yet have a central organizing principle that I could kind of say uh, goes across. Um, but uh, hey, there's a lot of uh, creativity and attention given mm -hmm. to uh, how we communicate with our words. Unfortunately, I have to use words to talk to you. Mm -hmm. But um, fortunately, uh, you have to use words to listen to me. My, my own. One of the things that's striking yeah. about Hoagland's approach to text is it's highly aesthetic, uh, which makes it very interesting. Love that. Um, my, my favorite metaphor for kind of language and how we communicate is that is that there's like a, a little tube connecting humans and then I have to use a very tiny paintbrush and words which are like little paint strokes and I have to quickly paint an impressionist image in your head with the words that I use as best I can, knowing fully that when I think I'm using like a purple violet, it's gonna turn into like a crimson in your head because damn it, the colors don't actually sort of match. But I have just a couple seconds to like light up uh, an image in your head and then hope that it's sort of close to what I thought I was communicating. And if, we're, if I'm lucky, um, and we're communicating well, you'll mirror back to me that, you know, so, sort of got it and it registers this way or, oops, did you mean this? Or that we have like maybe an error correction loop. But but this little, this little serial device of language is, is like, for me, like very much like impressionist painting. Um, thanks, Mark, that was great. That was really interesting. Uh, let's go Stacy, Doug, Grace. Um, well, I don't have that much to share other than um, I've been getting a lot of uh, bad headaches and I mentioned to Jerry that I couldn't get an appointment with the medical professional until March. 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 So I had been discussing that with Wendy and she recommended a homeopathic cure, which I ordered. And since I ordered it, I've been getting all this new reading material, which brings me back to my original interest, which is the um, power of light and healing. And when I start going there and looking into that, which is probably where I'm, what I'm going to spend most of my time doing, it reminds me of my original interest in sound frequency. So hearing, you know, this whole thing with talk and text and sound, um, it just triggers a lot of wheels going. And that's yeah. about it. Thank you. Um, um, we're friends with Ivy Ross, who was a member of my relationship economy expedition back in 2010. And we held a meeting at her house near, uh, what's the name of the, Albuquerque. And um, she has a room, she's heavily into sound. She's also into Chinese face reading uh, and a few other things. She's been the, I think the manager of Google Heart, Google Glass or something like that. And now I think she's at Google X. Um, anyway, uh, she had a room full of, like you could sit under a bunch of tubular bells that would make noise and feel the vibrations. And I, I've forgotten all the different setups, but it was all about 
sounds of different frequencies and vibrations and, and uh, how they interact with the body. It was quite, quite fascinating. Um, I don't know that she gives tours or anything like that, but. <laughs> one, day when I'm more, one day when I'm more prepared, I'll tell you about uh, a very expensive sound bed that I purchased that I had been using for a long time. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing. Um, the songs are, you know, they have everything's in different frequencies and you lay on this zero gravitational kind of bed and it massages you at the same time. And it's, you know, it ties in meditation. It's amazing. It really is. I, um, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> well, there's an artist who created a bed, um, an artist in England. I'll try to look that up. Um, it's a song. It's a sound bed as well. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Doug Grace Gill. Oh, what's really been on my mind and about which I'd like your opinions is the following. Uh, is climate change a final nudge towards creating an effective world government? And um, you would think like alien invasion would be a good reason for that too, right? Is there some, is there some catalyzing event that, that affects us all? that will bring us all together into some government. Um, well, it's climate change, that event. Right, exactly. Anybody? It's, it's, it, it looks to me like there's no possibility we can stay under two degrees with anything like current approaches so that we're in a really bad way and we need something really different. Go ahead, Mark. Doug, I think that there has to be not exactly sure how to put this, but basically taking the term fractalization or fractal. So I've been having uh, campfires with three people and two people who don't know each other. And we just let the conversation emerge. There should be another larger scale, like maybe the nine people that we have here another larger scale, like um, maybe short of a classroom, short of 30 people, but certainly the classroom scale, um, you know, neighborhood, um, part of a city, city, bioregion, you know, going up to um, global. I don't think you get global government without sort of that global, globally harmonized scale. Um, I don't think we can simply say, okay, you people who are way up there, go fix it. I don't think that's the way it, it can work. And so I would be as interested in, say, you know, this global kind of government as um, uh, having a girlfriend again. <laughs> and, and meaning that, um, you know, the intimacy that comes from a relationship. And hey, I invite everybody, if you know anybody who's female who, uh, or identifies as female who is interested, <laughs> please let me know. <laughs> you could start like the OGM dating service. That'd be kind of exactly. cool. Exactly. I am turning 59 and I'm asking for help. Um, uh, so uh, let's see. Um, but basically point, point is um, how do we integrate the relationships of people who are honest citizens and have an honest citizenry in, intent and basically integrate along many different scales of possible connection or actual connection to the issues that we care about. Does that make sense, Doug? Could you respond to that? Yeah, but I think we just don't have time for that kind of organic emergence. Uh, I imagine and I, when I say I imagine, it's not adequate, but it's just the beginning in my own mind, that uh, seven wise men choose to come together and say, we are going to take charge here. And we're asking the world's countries to give us access to their military uh, to control the situation, and that we open up the oil companies and stop the burning of fossil fuels and develop a welfare program to take care of all the people that are hurting and realize it's going to be a very messy process. But 
what else can we do? Uh, all the organic and localization processes without some integration uh, to the global level are not gonna be able to take on the oil companies. Uh, John, you've got some background noise. Do you mind muting? Yeah. Really interesting background noise, though. Yeah, that's true. Sounds alien. You know, it's interesting you're saying about, I, I, to me, when I saw what happened at COP26 and every time the governments get together is for me, it feels like it has to be a much more organic or business-led solution. I don't think the governments are going to ever get together. There's too much nationalism, too much separatism, you know, to, uh, but I think, you know, call me a cynic, but I think that when business gets behind it and realize it's actually going to be more expensive to destroy the world, I think we have a lot better chance of things happening. But, actually, that's far from the most cynical thing you might have said right there. <laughs> you actually like, we're hopeful that business could help. That's good. That's not, that's not that cynical. I never I give up hope completely, yeah, but yeah. That's good. <laughs> And people are trying to hack the system, so they're trying to win, you know, uh, board major board seat majorities at some of these companies, so that they can change the entire company. A couple other things like that. This morning, I saw a thread of, of let's let's buy Monsanto, let's buy Bayer Monsanto, basically, uh, you know, let's all just buy a lot of shares in this thing until we can control uh, the shares. So, well, people are demanding it. I think it's coming actually, oddly enough, bottom up with consumers. I think we are realizing what kind of power we have. Just exactly with, um, you know, workers now are are ha finally having some kind of power as well. I don't know if it will be enough to shift, but hopeful. Yeah. Um, uh, Grace then Gill, who raised his hand a little earlier. I guess, like. Uh, it may be true that we don't have time, but, and that, it, you know, but it doesn't matter. Like, it's not that when you talk about like, oh, we're gonna come in and have the military and some wise people and whatever. It's, it's clear to me that there is nothing that is so urgent and horrible that um, it would bring us together. And I know that because we just had two years of a pandemic and utter and complete failure, horrible censorship of the scientific establishment, even bigger censorship all over the world. We now have the a truth in whatever initiative, whatever that's called, truth and in information initiative, where all of the major newspapers and social media sites tell us what the scientific truth is. I mean, it's so bad that it is clear absolutely that something as urgent as you and your children will die from a disease is not urgent enough. And it's just been flubbed completely. If the number, if the, more, if the fatality rate were 50% as opposed to 2%, I what think the conversation might be genuinely different. Um, uh, but I doubt, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Right? Well, that's but, that's because, not the problem premise in uh, Ministry for the Future. Right. You know, is that a, a 20 million people in a few weeks death event catalyzes attention? Mm -hmm. But even that turns out to not be enough. That turns out to not be enough, it, it right? Takes, like I read through the whole you know, thing. It, it takes it, it takes the decentralized governance in the form of drone swarms, you know, terrorist drone swarms, to bring the system to heal. And that's only one of a number of things, right? It takes um, an institution, like what the institution did was redefine money. It redefined money twice and it redefined uh, the media. I think it's a pretty realistic uh, depiction of the magnitude of what has to happen on many different fronts. Probably not what will happen, but yeah. I mean, you just looked at that. I think the Ministry of the Future gave a very, very good outlook at like, these are all the things that need to change. And for me, that's why I work in the area of money because as long as money is our main transaction method, there's, you know, and it is going to come from the ground up because money is bankrupt. But I think that even looking at the pandemic, it's like the callousness of, of the world to one another. I mean, it's not even from up to down. It's just everywhere. It's just this callousness and breakdown of culture that is, yeah, that's what I have to say. Yeah. Um, Gil, then Ken. Uh, well, where to start here? Um, 
And this, uh, Gil, you're on my check-in list also. This is not your check-in so much as what I thought you wanted to comment oh. on this thread. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me, let me that, that helps. Let me just yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was let me put the pieces out. Yeah, you, you're, you're due for checking in in just a sec. Okay, so, so comment piece. Um, um, golly. Um, Doug Carmichael, I love you dearly, uh, but I don't love the direction you're going on this. <laughs> Um, you know, the, 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 the story of the, you know, seven wise, um, powerful um, people who will bring sense to this whole thing depends on, pick, you know, who's going to pick who those people are. Uh, you know, um, the, we have a system of, 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 of you know, of, of, of wise apes that have, you know, a tens of thousands of years of history of cooperation, cooperation in small groups in a planetary system governed by sociopaths. So in, in my view, uh, the seven pick themselves and yeah, say, yeah. we are gonna lead. And, and, the, and the ones who will pick to lead, who can muster the forces, who can clobber the countries and gather the armies are gonna be sociopaths too. Um, or you know, what's it gonna take for countries to yield themselves to this group of seven when they won't even yield themselves to a gathering of 200 of their fellow countries? Um, I had a friend who was this week just decrying the failure of COP as a you know, guaranteed failure because it was a consensus process. But how do you get to a situation where people, are gonna, where people in countries are gonna suborn their sovereignty? to the larger global interest. And that's the mystery. Grace, I don't think that, that the COVID thing was an utter and complete failure. It was an utter and incomplete failure. Uh, you know, there was enormous mobilization. There was vaccines produced in record time. There was $9 trillion of investment manifested without anybody ever asking where the money's gonna come from. So there's some so, amazing- Look, Gil, I'm, I'm starting from the idea that uh, there's nothing going on that's going to keep us from going up to four degrees and above. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got to do something really different. Yeah. So we've got to release our imagination to come up with things that, if they could work, would yeah. actually do it. And we don't have very many of those. I, I, I totally agree with that. And, um, and I think, you know, the, the, the September it may not be imaginative enough for us here. I'm looking for something that's more imaginative than that. Because I don't have- Yeah, me too. I don't have a lot of faith in that one. I've been reading um, the Graeber and Wengrove book, the, uh, the Dawn of Everything, which I strongly, strongly recommend that people read and that we talk more about. Um, and um, um, <laughs> the skeptical is good too. Sounds like a plumbing part, but still. Yeah, you know, the, the, for so far I'm about, I'm about an eighth of the way through so far. My main takeaway so far is that um, in, the, in the last, you know what, 30, 50, 100,000 years of human history, you have an enormous variety of social forms and social organization. And, and they're putting forth humans as an experimental species. We try lots of different things. We're not on a linear development path. We're in and out of different forms, not only on historical scales, but even on seasonal scales of tribes that are authoritarian in part of the year and egalitarian in part of the year based on the you know, resource activities required in different times. So, uh, and, and of course, you know, Graeber as, as a leading anarchist thinker has great faith in the ability of humans to voluntarily associate and figure shit out. And in fact, part of the story they tell is that in a lot of the original human formations, people spent a lot of time talking with each other about everything all day. You know, it wasn't a lot of time taken to gather stuff and, 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 and survival. And a lot of time was spent talking and thinking and imagining and making decisions together. This goes back also to Marshall Salins, who was, yeah. um, who was his PhD advisor, I think. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's a remarkable read. And so, you know, in the optimism of Graeber, I then think about, good Lord, how challenging it is just to live with one other person or a family or an extended family and just how enormously challenging that is. Now, granted, that's in the context of a, of a broken society. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of pulled between the contrast of those and, you know, it's back and, and uh, not in the abstract, in the context of Doug's question, which I think about a lot, you know, what does it take? Um, and it's, it's, it's frankly right now hard to see to what I think, Ingrid, you were saying, uh, business is already in the lead on this. Business is ahead of government in many parts of the world. And my, I think my, my current main takeaway from the COP is that the leadership shifts from the, from the national governments to the street, to the kids in the street, 
and to Wall Street, uh, who is moving very quickly to shift capital priorities and allocation. I mean, big, big financial managers are divesting from fossil and moving into renewables hard. And that may have more impact than any chunk of legislation we're able to propagate in this mm -hmm. country or the other. Anyhow. Um, Ken, then me, then back to the queue. Hello, everybody. Um, Yay. I'm hoping that someone here is more versed in what I'm going to inquire about than I am. I recently came across something about um, youth in China laying down in the streets. And yeah. yeah. what I took away from that, because I didn't see the whole thing, was that mm -hmm. they were saying, you know, we're not going to freaking work in factories 12, 15 hours a day for low wages because we can make the same amount of money delivering pizzas. Mm -hmm. And um, there's it's enormous youth movement mm -hmm. that's just saying we reject the current economic um, ordering. And um, related to that, uh, those of you who know John Perkins, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, mm -hmm. uh, his book a few years ago. He wrote another book that I read, which I don't remember the title of. It was about his time in South America. And mm -hmm. um, he put forth the, the assertion that the reason that several of the large uh, cities there failed was because people recognized they needed to abandon the city and go back to the jungle. They could not continue to sustain themselves. And they, collectively, they said, this isn't working for us. We have to get out of here. We have to go back to the jungle because we can't. We, we've got too many people concentrated in one place that's not working anymore. So, um, is it this one? Is it Secret History of American Empire? Because uh, here's here's Confessions, which yeah. is which is the most interesting, worst written book I've read in <laughs> forty years. He's a shit writer. He is a shit writer, but his stories are fantastic. His stories are amazing. Yeah, it, it might have been uh, Secret History of American Empire. Yeah, but um, so I just throw those two things out as uh, to go along with what Gil's talking about from uh, Dawn of Everything, which I got my Audible copy yesterday. I haven't started yet. Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges that we have is is the challenge of imagination that we try to go into problem solving this issue and it ain't going to be problem solved it's a fucking wicked mega mess and requires huge uh unleashing of imagination and so my question is what does it look like for us to come together as a, as collectives of all stripes everywhere and start imagining a better future and not worry about is it possible or not? Things, people will never go for that. Just start painting those big pictures. And if enough of us do that, sooner or later, we're going to start to coalesce some things that are going to be really viable. So I think the problem is imagination. I don't think the problem is money. Um, thanks, Ken. Uh, let me put a couple uh, thoughts in the room uh, on this topic and then go to Doug and then back to the queue. Um, <clears throat> so one is, I, I think a lot about uh, big G government versus little g governance. And I think that we've like we've, we're breaking big G government. Big G governments are, are failing to act. They're capturable, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the nice things about grassroots distributed anarchistic movements is that they're less subject to, to capture because the moment you have a pyramid, it's like, oh, awesome. All I have to do is capture the top of the pyramid and we're rock and rolling. And, and if a peasant from the, the, the state of Georgia captures the you know, USSR's uh, pyramid, look what happens. You know, uh, tens of millions of people die from stupid policies. All kinds of really, really bad, stupid things happen when a when a paranoid peasant takes over like a, a large country that has a lot of resources. And um, so, I'm very interested in governance, self governance. How do how do governance methods interpenetrate? How do they collaborate? How does this work at a social scale? That's like like hugely important to me. And and I think actually more doable than we think it is. And I see uh, Graver and Wengro's book as like really nice evidence that, hey, we've been experimenting a really long time. We know how to do this. Uh, let, let, let's sort of go there. And I like Graber's background as an anarchist because I think he comes from that belief system that um, we are able to piece together really like useful methods together. And, and there's more to say there. But the second thing I'll say is borrowing from the Navy SEALs, uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Uh, and this is my problem with politics today is that, you know, uh, deep canvassing is slow canvassing. It's like instead of stopping at the door and saying, hey, vote for so and so, here's a pamphlet and leaving, you stop and you start a conversation and 40 minutes later you might leave. And it turns out that if you slow down and actually have a conversation, you change more people's minds. Hmm. 
Bing. And this is, this is the bare bones little tip of the iceberg of actually a long-term relationship building and trying to actually come back into the fabric of society and sharing what we know and helping people out when they're in trouble. And there's, there's 50 things you could do there that are more interesting than deep canvassing, but the lessons of deep canvassing are that slowing down actually changes minds and changes behavior. And that's great. Let's do, let's do more of that. And that's going to take goddamn time, right? Um, and then uh, there's a whole bunch of people who are either millenarianists or believe in the great turning. I mean, Steve Bannon is a big believer in the great turning hypothesis that says that every 70 years there's this great cycling through of, of social systems. And he wants to be the guy who's still alive on deck when the existing current system is broken and shattered and lying on the ground in pieces so that he can be the one, maybe the one of the new seven, to stand it up and say, this is how we're going to live life now. That's his hope. And there's a whole bunch of other people who believe in the rapture or in some other thing who are perfectly happy to destroy the systems we have right now. And we'll, we'll be willing to go to four degrees or whatever it takes to, to sort of pick up the pieces and be in control of what's left. And that's the fantasy that they're living in. And it's gonna be really hard to tear that fantasy out of their heads or their hands. I think that, that we're living in a world where there's a third to a half of the population that believes strongly in some sense of that. And that scares the shit out of me. And I'm really interested, one of the reasons Daryl Davis is one of my heroes is that he's been melting the hearts and brains of Ku Klux Klan members in a way where they leave the Klan. And the Klan is a, is a belief system and a community and a whole bunch of other things that are mutually reinforcing that are extremely strong until they're not. And so I, I think that there's parallels here. I think there's parallels about the millenarianists. Let's, we've, 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 let's ruin this rock on purpose so that we can reconstruct it kind of thing. I think those people can be walked back and that's going to be slow and take some time to do, right? And so, um, so then uh, the last thing I'll say is about collimation. You know, lasers collimate light. And one of the things that the far right has figured out is how to collimate energy and light and mm -hmm. human activity. And they're extremely good at that. And they punish anybody who steps out of line. If you go off message, you are punished immediately and very, very sharply. And if you look at the censure of Gosar that just happened yesterday, um, only a couple of Republicans were kind of willing to go, four didn't vote, two who've already, who are already Republican mavericks and already under attack daily from Republicans kind of moved over. But, but everybody's not willing to move because the second too many people move over, and it was interesting that 10 Republicans voted for the, the infrastructure project, 12, I think, and that four Democrats voted against, that was actually the first gesture of, hey, maybe these boundaries are a little softer than they could be. But the, the second that the dam breaks, the dam actually really breaks, and then whole systems change much quicker than we think they do, right? So, so a piece of what I'm really worried about is um, the left, and here I don't mean the political left, I mean progressives who believe in climate change, who think that we need, that the house is on fire, that we need to make urgent change, are just scattered all over the place with a bunch of different messages. And I kind of don't want them to collect up and collimate their energies into one message. I don't think that's actually a good idea or possible. And so I'm trying to figure out in my own little head, um, how does distributed activity in an anarchist governance model with a whole bunch of people doing a whole lot of things crawl into the head of ExxonMobil and Shell and BP and take them down and crawl into the coal companies and slow them down and stop them? And how, how do we do those kind of large scale things, but in a very distributed way? And in the meantime, rebuild community and come back into society and sort of fix stuff that's broken because we're actually gonna, if Kevin, if Kevin Costner's right in Waterworld and got, I, I'm just hoping Kevin Costner was wrong, wrong, wrong. The Postman, Waterworld, uh, and there's a third movie that he did, which is a shitty like dystopian science fiction movie. These are all like futures we're looking at right now. Right, like like w living on the oceans probably going to happen. If water le sea levels rise, three quarters of the Earth is covered in ocean. We might actually be in floating cities, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just hoping Kevin Costner is wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, but the process to get to the thing that might fix this is going to be slow. And if slow is smooth and smooth is fast, that would be great because maybe then we we stand a chance. But but for me, the authoritarian uh, let's seven people will emerge and they'll take over the militaries and force. The companies to close and all that is a dystopian science fiction novel, Doug. Like, like I, I hear that and I'm like, wow, I might actually be in the rebel alliance against that because I can easily see those pinch points becoming, um, you know, uh, ways in which people run their own agenda. And right now there's a whole bunch of people who want to run their own agenda or, across the whole world. And if they had control of military, woo-ha, 
then all bets are off. And I watched the Slaughterbots video a couple of years ago, which scared the hell out of me because there is nothing preventing Slaughterbots from actually happening. Really easy to manufacture little drones, making, making them lethal. There's 15 different ways to make them lethal. They are cheap as hell and really hard to stop unless you run an EMP and you could probably shield these little things so that they would resist like an electromagnetic pulse. I don't want to be the Secretary of Defense or the Secret Service for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Like this, this stuff is really like dangerous, lethal, and good luck trying to rein in auton uh, autonomous lethal force with AIs that know how to kill. Like good luck reining that in worldwide when terrorist organizations don't need to obey anybody's agenda or, or whatever else. That, that, that's going to be ugly. So sorry to wander into like 10 different territories there, but, but this is all kind of a package for me. And I'm really worried that the far right is figuring out how to make a laser beam and the far left has a bunch of flashlights on sea bass. Um, and I think that that doesn't, that, that doesn't bode well unless we figure out how to talk to each other, trust each other, and build good stuff together fast. Um, Doug, then Mark. So um, I think imagination is critical. And the seven men, the seven leaders, I didn't say men, the seven leaders approach is one kind of pseudopodia of imagination out into the unknown. And as many of you know, I'm on the opposite side because I've been drafting a book called Garden World Politics, which is how to get the local to really work uh, and the need for it, because I think that the major human needs are food and habitat ought to be solved together in the spirit of the Italian hill towns and things like that. Uh, and it's an attractive view. Uh, I go to the seven leaders because uh, the problem seems huge. It's cross-border and might require cross-border solutions. And we don't have a way of getting there unless somebody steps forth and says, we're going to do it. Uh, so I'm myself uh, thinking neither of those uh, pseudopodia, uh, Garden World and uh, the seven leaders, are it. Uh, we need more imagination, but I do want to face the fact that most people, what they're saying, will never get this, get us there. We've got to do something about the fossil fuels. And uh, I don't hear anybody saying, and it has uh, to happen much to open the door and take those guys out. And it happens, has to happen very quickly. And it, it's a little bit like hey, we've got some problems. We're going to have to throw the refrigerator and the stove and the furnace out the window. Yes. And you're like, like bullshit, we're not doing that. And you, know, you, you can see the coal industry saying, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, you're, you're not just going to shut us down tomorrow, that ain't happening, and using everything within their power to stay alive, right? And then there's no reason, kind of, other than the survival of humanity, that they shouldn't have that response uh, in this kind of setting. Um, Mark, uh, Mark, then Gil. Um, I don't know how to take this phrase, if you want peace, study war, but certainly... Um, I believe in studying war. Um, there's, uh, I don't think this is well known about a recent war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, where Azerbaijan bought Israeli drones um, and basically won the war, you know, without endangering um, many of their soldiers. Now, this kind of ties into problems with artificial intelligence it's not that artificial intelligence is going to get smart and kill us it's that artificial stupidity in the use of artificial intelligence by not very ethical people as well as use of you know non-autonomous drones by very unethical people i mean this is technology today and i, I i'm not i don't think you know, basically, a lot of the um, people who are, you know, on the, you know, artificial intelligence uh, fear squad um, are really focusing on the in the right place. Anyway, off to Gil. Thanks, Mark. Gil. Oh, golly, so many, <clears throat> so many threads here. Um, 
Jerry, to your stuff about going slow, I mean, it's, it's spoken like an Aikidoka. Uh, um, uh, I just passed my second Q exam a week ago. Good for you. I know, um, second Q. And it takes slowing down, but it also takes enormous practice to train the body and to train the nervous system to have different reactions. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and to react with patience even in the face of the most urgent situation. I mean, the, you know, the setup here is that three guys are coming at you with knives and swords. And what do you do? You, have, you absolutely have to not panic. You have to be calm. You have to move slowly. If you don't, you will die. And if you do, you might survive even against overwhelming odds. And this is, it's one thing to talk about this philosophically, but this practice of Aikido, you actually learn this in your body, different ways of being in the face of conflict and stress. And so, you know, the metaphor is very powerful. I don't know how that, how that scales out to society, but there's something there. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, oh yeah, yeah. Um, there was a webinar yesterday with Bill McKibben and Saul Griffith. You all know Bill McKibben's name. Saul is a MacArthur fellow based here in San Francisco, an engineer and technologist who's been doing some of the best nitty gritty nuts and bolts analytical work about what does it take to move to the sustainable, regenerative, <clears throat> renewable society. Uh, and this is a man who goes down deep into the numbers. Uh, and um, I, I'll see if I can find the link for it. The recording should be posted today. Uh, but the notion that we have to throw out all of our refrigerators and heating systems and so forth ain't, just isn't true. Um, I was on my webinar, my Living Between Worlds webinar yesterday. Somebody said, well, we're going to have to just, we're just have to live with, with half the energy. Well, no, not necessarily true. Uh, California's <clears throat> at half the energy per capita of the United States has been for the last 50 years. And what I meant was so, not that we'd have to get rid of all the devices, I don't think that at all, but that the companies need to be shut down. I was metaphorically saying an industry, an industry, coal, needs to be shut down. Yes, uh, yes, Sam, yes, yes, Sam, do you mind muting your, your mic? Yeah, Jerry. Sam, yes. can you mute? Sam probably can't hear you. I know. <laughs> Can you mute Hello, Sam. Sam. Can you, mute? can you mute, please? There he is, host. Can you mute him? There you go. Uh, I'm not host. Oh, okay. We're in the collective next uh, chat, and I, I have no, I have no mute power. Land of the mystery host. The yes, thank you. Thanks, Sam. The coal industry has to be shut down. The coal industry will die. The question is how fast, um, and I want to see it fast. But for the folks who say shut it down tomorrow, means you have millions of, you know, hundreds of millions of people who die rapidly. There has, there has to be a phase transition. The question is, do you phase it over 30 years or three years? Uh, and uh, I think part of the challenge, and I hear this from what you're calling the left or the eco cluster, whatever it is as well, is, um, is that we can't transition quickly. And in fact, we can. Uh, you know, the United States did wartime economy in 1942 in nine months. Uh, it's back to what folks were saying at the top of the call of what's urgent enough to generate, you know, focused, coordinated collective action. And it takes a common perception of what we're facing. Um, uh, if, if you'll indulge, I'm going to stick in the chat. On, on, on the call yesterday, we, we were talking about what Ken was saying before about messes, about wicked messes. And, you know, the problem solution mindset is just not sufficient to what we're facing here because there's not a problem to be fixed. There's a whole bunch of intertwingled shit. Uh, all interconnected uh, and very different interpretations of what the mess is. Um, a friend of mine says that prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. Uh, and so I'm very interested in the diagnosis. Um, and my friend Sean C. Bell says there's three elements to a good diagnosis. One is stating what's so, and second is talk, it, it's, uh, describing how we got here. And third is talking about why are we stuck? Why won't things move? And I just sort of, you know, let me see if I can find this real quick. Uh, whoops, whoops, whoops. So I got the chat in the way of the notes. So this is long for the chat, but uh, I haven't done this into an article yet. So when I think about how and why are we stuck, these are the first 10 things that come to my mind. And the point of it is not to say this is the right list, it's to say we have so many different places to look here. This is not gonna be a single strategy solution. This is gonna be 
is another kind of swarms of drones of people taking on these different elements of the stuckness. It's not something where you can throw a switch and fix it. Um, multi-layered, multi-leveled, interpenetrating, pervasive, and I've probably spoken too much, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, Stacy. So <laughs> you've all spoken about the need for imagination. So I have to say, this is hard to make this comment, but I wonder what it would look like if we amorphize these industries that we want to get rid of just long enough to see, you know, imagine they were a person with feeling and, and that we're connected to them in some way. How do we, how do we go, you know, it's like, how do we treat the bully or how do we try to meet their needs or take away their fears so that they're not fighting us as we're trying to make this change? Because, you know, when I think about the people, I mean, I don't know a lot of people in the 1%, but the people that I've come across, and then those people going lower down, they're all some way connected. And there's this fear that whether they're aware of it or not, that they will lose something. And when you, you know, when you go further and say, yes, I will lose something, but what I'll get is so much better that makes that shift so much easier. So I don't really have a clear answer, but I'm just saying, what about if we just went to the beginner's mind for a minute and just thought of this, these organizations, because they're made up of people and they're not all bad people and they're not all the enemy. So thank you. Just wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Stacey. Uh, I totally agree. And, and and in slightly different in slightly different circumstances, they, we would be friends, and we would be trying to figure out our, our way together through these things. Um, I think Grace had the drop from the call, uh, so we've got uh, Gil. If you want to do a check in, uh, then Ingrid, then Ken. Um, yeah, um, the check in briefings I've spoken a lot is that. Um, like a lot of us, I'm in turmoil right now and unsettled. Uh, and part of it is trying to figure out this shit in the larger world. Uh, part of it is health issues um, with myself and Jane. Stacy, um, uh, echoing what you were saying earlier on, Jane, Jane is a homeopath uh, and a long-term cancer patient and sort of living between the worlds of Western medicine and integrative medicine um, and very challenged right now. Um, because the trends, uh, the trends are not good right now. And she's really struggling trying to figure out what to do. And I'm trying to support her in what to do. Um, and it's, um, it's really challenging, maybe in some ways similar to the climate discussion we're having, because the right path is not clear at all. Um, every path has risks. Every path has consequences. Every path has uncertain results. It's at a, you know, to a certain degree, it's very much of a personal choice to say, I'm gonna flip the coin and go this way um, with, you know, with as much presence and awareness and thoughtfulness as possible in the midst of you know, what's uh, you know, a real, real life existential fear. Um, I've got, uh, I've got my own versions of that uh, with some health issues coming up and the doctor saying, do this and the acupuncturist saying, eh, maybe you shouldn't do that. Um, and, you know, and again, you know, clear risks and consequences in any path um, and very, just very hard to figure out. Um, um, and um, the other dimension of this is that as, as I've talked about in some calls before, I'm once again, trying to figure trying to figure out what to do when I grow up, which is to say, what's my work now? You know, where is my contribution now? Uh, in a way that um, you know uh, is a real contribution to the conundrum, to the wicked messes that we're in, uh, but that also can financially take care of me and Jane in a future where I may not be able to work eighty hours a week. I, mean, I already can't. I can't can't work forty at this point. Um, and I know in my head that you know human productivity peaks probably at somewhere around thirty. Damn that! Um, I'm I'm really happy if I can do a good twenty in a week. Ken, I don't know which part of that you're <laughs> thing to. Um, um, so I'm so I'm just thinking a lot personally about um, 
uh, you know, what are my strengths? What are my skills? Where's my contribution? Uh, how do I work this? What, what you know, uh, at, at, and the tip of the spear is kind of what are the offers that I make into the world? What are the, the economic offers um, that I make? Um, and I would actually, if, if folks would be willing, I would love to have some private conversations with those of you who know me more than just in this call um, to invite your perspective and guidance. That, that sounds beautiful, Gil. Um, please raise your hand if you are asking yourself the same question Gil just asked. <laughs> Jerry, thank you. That's wonderful. You're not alone. You're not alone. And this is a and this is a good crowd to talk about these things with. And we might even choose a topic like this for next Thursday's check-in call or, or Thursday, you know, or GM call or something different. Like, like how do we put our energies into the world, our life energy, our remaining life energy into the world in a in a good way right now is a great question and, and an important question. Um, so thank you. Um, I've got Ingrid Ken John. Very interesting. Um, I finally joined the call and maybe Gil, you just um, sort of uh, it really hit it on the head with me in, in so many ways, uh, very similar things that I've been thinking about. It's interesting. I, I um, had a uh, job opportunity that I was really excited about that would have, have to deal with uh, net zero cities and climate change. I didn't get it. I was completely excited again, which professionally, which I haven't been in quite some time, I have to say about anything that I'm earning money on. Um, and, uh, and it was, and then, you know, it was at the same time that COP26 is happening. And also, again, I saw that and I thought, how do you make sense of all this? I felt like watching another gathering of all the world leaders with their backroom deals, not really confronting anything, you know, have, you know, these, these, uh, you know, milk toast kind of uh, agreements coming out of it that mean nothing. Um, you know, yeah, it's a really difficult time right now. And I think, um, I think one of the other things I think about too is uh, the Netherlands just got put into a, you know, lockdown here for three weeks because our numbers are crazy. It's really mostly kids that are getting it now, but um there is just such a collective sense of we're exhausted. We're exhausted by what we've gone through in the last year and a half. We still have these huge things confronting us that we have to deal with, and they are right here. You know, the flooding, the wildfires. Um, yeah, what do we do with this collective sense of exhaustion? And how do we keep up, you know, uh, just a, an excitement about it? And I will say that though, um, you know, just as an aside, when I had the opportunity at this job and I thought it would happen, I suddenly became, you know, a whirlwind of excitement and, and hopeful and enthusiastic again. But yeah, anyway, that's what I'm wrestling with is sort of trying how to stay in the game, how to really, you know, um, make a decision and, and, um, and go for something when there are so many things. So that's just where I am this week. <laughs> Ingrid, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we had uh, Ken, John, Michael. So um, I'm in a very interesting state. Um, thanks to Matt Saia, I have now spoken to a thousand people about uh, inclusion. Uh, it's been a really interesting five months. I've been working with uh, part of a facilitation team that Matt put together for a global financial services firm to examine um, microaggressions and inclusion in, in their organization. And I've been, um, for four of those months, I was just sitting way too much. So for the last month, I've really been making an effort to get outside and walk. And I've been walking um, up on the mountain almost every day, like five, five days a week, uh, four or five miles a day. So it's, it's trimmed me down a little bit, which is great because my clothes are getting tight. That feels really good. But I've just been reflecting as this is drawing to a close, you know, this was not training. This was me engaging in a conversation with a thousand people about what inclusion looks like <clears throat> from all these perspectives. And yesterday as I was walking at this image of Ken as a ball moving along. And every time I talk, um, there's, there's usually, when I lead one of these conversations, usually at least a dozen people. So I have people that are above me and below me and left and right and behind me. And each time the ball expands 
and then it goes snaps back. And over the last five months, my ball has gotten a lot bigger. It's it just feels way more um, robust and and high resolution, and and things that were kind of nascent in my mind are now solid in my mind, and and ways of relating to people and hearing their stories and guiding them because uh, a lot of times people are reticent to talk and getting them to talk. And um, so it, in many ways, it's up my facilitation chops quite a bit. But the, the, the thing that's really interesting to me is what I'm sensing for patterns and how I'm, I know these same patterns exist in so many organizations, you know, meetings, for example, one, one managing director said meetings are the delivery system for non-inclusive behavior and senior management is the most egregious example of that. Wow. And I'm like, whoa, that is so amazing, right? And then the thing that just gave me totally goosebumps was we asked people at the end, will you please make a commitment? Go for something really modest, something you can do on a regular basis that you think will improve. And there was an African-American woman who was an admin person with the company 23 years. She said, I'm not going to commit to anything. I'm going to recommit based on this because i've been here a long time and i've seen a lot of initiatives come and go and based on this call and these people and what you're saying i'm going to recommit to believing the company is serious about inclusion and i was like holy shit that's just gave me goosebumps so i have all these swirling emotions of of great gratitude and a feeling of honor and and happy that it's improved my bank account and the sense of um i really want to keep doing this i'm not quite sure what the next steps are um, and just marveling at how there's now over 10,000 people in this company have gone through this. And I've, yeah. I've been part of a 10th of that. Right. And people really are, there's been some pushback of can't change culture. It's really bad. People are saying, no, we're, we're going to speak up. We're going to keep doing this. And so I think there's a, um, there's a sense of all this drip irrigation that's, that's softening up the, the hard, the parched soil. And that things are really going to start to grow there. So um, I don't. I'm just sharing. This is what's been in my mind the last few days, um, and and how that has played out. And the last thing I'll say is, my wife actually said to me, "You know, you've become a better person as a result of doing this work." So um, I, I, in spite of all the challenge in the world, one conversation at a time around difficult issues with a dozen or so people with somebody who's you know, a skill facilitator can make an enormous difference. And so I think that's another, another piece of the puzzle. We have, to, we have to find that work. We have to find that ability to hang in there and talk to people about, you know, their pain and, and suffering and, and really sensitize people to, um, uh, to how to be together in ways where we don't keep triggering each other. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just been really, it's been really, really awesome for me. And I'm, incredibly grateful and a little depressed that it's coming to an end you know like mm. oh geez you know. but also like it has to come to an end at some point and i have to figure out how to integrate all this and you know what can i do to reflect back the patterns that i'm seeing in a way so that would be useful a couple of things and i'll pass to you gil um each of these so you saw a thousand people um each of these groups was new to you and you only got to talk to them once i think right in the process Correct. yes yeah um i would i and i would love to read your memoirs of this part like or if you recorded a video summarizing whatever it is like however you wanted to externalize some of these these things and and how they've changed you i would love to to understand that and, and read that um and then are there parts of this that can be externalized out into the, the the general world like like is this a is this a thing you would like to stand up um as an ongoing process and might that be doable and so forth is that in your head i mean very much um, so I have over 30 pages of notes. I, I, we're not recording the calls so people can feel. Uh, we we are recording this call. No, no, yeah. I'm talking about those calls. Yeah. Yeah. We don't record in this call. So people feel totally comfortable. Um, I always say to people, sometimes we get into really interesting conversations. People share deeply meaningful and personal stories. And we encourage that because it's much more powerful than hearing a disembodied voice, you know, an actor saying this is what happened. Um, so if you hear something that's that's useful to you, feel free to to spread the learning, but leave the personal details out so people feel their confidence is respected. Mm -hmm. um, and I have direct quotes and you know observations that I've put together, and I'm I'm going to put them into some kind of, of format and offer that back to to Matt because um, he did invite me into this, and I, I feel like it'd be a 
a nice gesture to you know do some sense making all right yeah. I'm, I'm all about that reflective part so um and I've been thinking like, what can I write about this that would leave the, the details of the organization out that I could put together in this, a blog post or a series of blog posts that might be useful for other people um, who are, are also looking to you know, improve situations. That sounds awesome. Gil? Yeah, uh, Ken, I'm, I'm very inspired and provoked by this, what you've shared. Um, and a couple of things. I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious why this organization decided to do this at this scale. I'm curious why 10,000 and not 17,000. Uh, but I'm mostly curious about how you or the folks that you work with on this could bring this kind of process to other critical organizations. Because um, it sound, it, it sound, it's, it's one of the more interesting and creatively stimulating things I've heard in a long time. It opens up all sorts of possibility uh, for exactly the kind of transformation we've been struggling with through this whole call. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an example of what Jerry was talking about of the, you know, the, of the, of the, what was the quote from the Navy SEALs, Jerry? Uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I just, you know, I, I, you know, deep bow to you, encouragement. If you're wondering if there's something here, yes, there's something here. Oh, I know there's something, Clearly here, yeah, something for sure. here. And whether it's for you to do or for them to do or for some combination of people to do, this is really juicy. Um, and um, what was the other thing? Um, lost. There was another. There was another piece in the thread, but that's that's enough. So, um, oh yeah, yeah. It's this. It's that a um, um, as as you think about other key organizations. Um, uh, I mean, where my mind immediately went is to the oil and gas industry, where there are companies and people struggling with various degrees of sincerity and maturity about what does the transition look like. Mm -hmm. And some are going to milk it all the way down for maximum profits and maximum delay. Some of them are thinking very seriously about, well, who are we? You know, like we've got, we've got, you know, we know how to drill through rock. We know how to pump fluids. We know how to, you know, reprocess complex chemistry. What can we do with these skills in a different world? Um, and a buddy of mine um, last month did the first convening of the chief sustainability officers of all of, I don't know, 50 companies in Houston. And she's trying to open up something there. It's a, I think it's a very mixed bag and very dangerous uh, co-op. But just to plant in your imagination, is there a process like you have just done that could be brought into a major oil and gas industry company or group of companies and what might emerge? from that and that'd i'm happy be, to introduce you to her if it's if it's of interest that'd be that'd be awesome um i did not put together the program that mm -hmm. was designed there's a third party um there's the company that hired uh matt who's doing the facilitation and then third company that did third party that did all this work but it's That's very fun. replicable mm -hmm. and um yeah i've just I, part of it is I've really begun to flourish as I made it my own because for the first 30 sessions or so, I was kind of following the script and it's like, you know, I'm going to just sort of, I'm going to riff on what's going on here. And I started to really engage at a different level with people and that got really interesting. And um, I know there's ways to adapt this to, to different things. So um, as far as why not, all 17,000 are supposed to go through it, but apparently a bunch of people have just decided they didn't want to go. So I'm not sure of the internal politics there. Um, I don't know what to say about that. The, the intent is to get everybody in the company through it. Um, and there've been some people who've been very resistant and people who are like, I don't understand pronouns. I don't understand microaggressions. If I give you a compliment, that's a compliment. You should take it as a compliment. And those are the folks who are really stuck in the judge me for my intent, not my impact. Mm -hmm. um, and helping people step across to the other side and say, and I use the example of, of when we got married, my wife and I took dance lessons. Now, mm -hmm. neither of us, had the intention to step on the other person's foot because we were moving in new ways. We were stepping on each other's foot all the time. Ow, you're on my foot. And if we just said, well, it's not a big deal. I didn't mean it, get over it. We wouldn't have actually lasted very long, right? So it's that ability to say, oh, I'm sorry. Thanks for being up to my attention. You know, I'm really working on this hard and I, I can't quite get this. So let's keep practicing, you know, and I, I, I will endeavor to do better that's the attitude that's needed. So there's a lot of this about just adjusting attitudes of how people recognize that we do make mistakes all the time. You're 
background is different than mine and and we bump up against each other and if we can simply say oh i see we have different backgrounds let's figure out how to move in harmony instead of i'm doing a good job i'm paying you a compliment you know get over it that doesn't work that just inflames things so Thanks, anyway i i don't want to take up a huge amount of time here but no, thank you for that was great and... that was really important thank you um uh, john michael julian Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I want to start by saying thank you or express gratitude to the entire group. This is healing and stretching for me just, just to hear most of this conversation. I'm going to mention just a couple of little tiny footnotes. It, many of you will know some of these already, but they're just kind of things to put into the notes uh, as far as things to pick up, uh, for examples that uh, people raised. One is uh, an odd one that just came to me hearing from Ken, and that's uh, 3M Corporation. Now, my work with them was a very long time ago, so you know a lot can happen in 20 plus years. Um, but they used to, they were, when I worked with them, they were um, better, better than an awful lot of people for saying, oh, we got this process what's let's switch it you know let's use it some other way and of course you know there's all these examples that get quoted post-it notes you know they had a glue and it was a bad glue <laughs> you know it was ineffective glue but they they transformed it into post-it notes and, and so they have is deep in their culture at least they used to have deep in their culture this idea of take the thing you know how to do and disconnect it from possibly its um, point of origin which might have consequences that you don't want uh, for either the business or for the, for the culture. So it's just a, a footnote uh, to tap. Another similar footnote, uh, a lot of you know about uh, David Snowden uh, and his systems approach. Uh, and he would say, I believe, if you're in chaos, which arguably parts of us are going in and out of chaos all the time, he doesn't think chaos lasts very long. It, it, it used to be moved from chaos into complexity, one of the other phases. But that while you're in chaos, the only thing it's reasonable to do are experiments, small interventions, and you disconnect from the um, idea that, oh, how are we going to generalize this? How are we going to get the reach? You just say, let's try this thing and let's be careful to notice how it works or doesn't work. And then later on, the issue of how do you generalize it? will emerge when you're not uh, in the chaotic state. So kind of common sense. And a third example that I have brought up here, but not many people know about it, and I don't want to, it's an, a historical example. It's the, it's the Meiji Restoration in Japan. I know a little about it. I pro, you know, I'd like to <laughs> maybe check this out with somebody who's Japanese and knows Japanese history. But my understanding is that they did something, you know, they had a bunch of samurai, they had a bunch of minor nobles who were in an economic system and a, and a status system and a hierarchy that was going to hold Japan back. They, they would not be able to resist the West if they kept doing things that they were doing. So they were going to have to get them to shift. And the way they got them to shift was they bought them out with bonds during a period of semi-intended inflation. And the, what, what the people who received those bonds in exchange for land, in exchange for certain other things, were then motivated to do was to start companies and to invest in industrialization because that's what the bonds were good for. You couldn't go back and do the, do the feudalism thing anymore. That, that was clear to them that that was ending. If, you, if we run that forward, I, I was trying to think of, you know, would that work? In the United States now, I don't know. <laughs> what I was trying to think of was a kind of a, a moral Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, I mean, like a, if there was an international uh, digital currency that people trusted in a way that they don't trust either their governments nor actual Bitcoin, um, you could pay people in in something like that, and you, you know, then they would resist less as you took away from them what we're, what's going to have to be taken away from the coal industry and the fossil fuel industry. And 
they would have value. They would and they would have a an implicit or explicit time limit in terms of you need to convert this value into something green. Um, go for it. Mm -hmm. um, John, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, um, kind of sadly, maybe ironically, kind of a bitter part of American history, but before the 14th Amendment and 13th Amendment and a proclamation freeing slavery, um, there were plans to buy out the slaves. There were plans to pay plantation owners for their slaves. And also, you know, before that era, the way you knew who the wealthiest person was in America was the person who owned the most humans. Yeah. That, that was a, it was a measure of wealth. Right. Um, and so, and so, so many deep things had to change, and some of which are still stuck, you know, back in the reptilian brain of America, unfortunately, uh, plaguing us still to this day. But, but this, this kind of that that size of change is, is really hard to steer. So I, I don't know very much about the bond story from the Meiji Restoration, but I'm like eager to to find some good materials on that. Thank you for, thank you for that a lot. Um, we have a few more people and 15 more minutes. Uh, Michael, Julian, Eric, Sam. Hi all. Um, to answer a question that uh, Ingrid asked me in, in direct messaging, yes, I realize that there are two of me up here because I've switched devices, and um, I didn't want to lose the chat, which by logging into a new device I would. Um, but then I've also realized that uh, on a phone you don't have those three dots to save the the chat file somewhere. So but I always share out the chat afterwards. So it'll be uh, it'll right. it'll I'm be not, on Mattermost, and the file will be there. I'm not going to worry about it then. I'm gonna, cool. Yeah, you you can leave your alter ego, your your clone, your lethal, autonomous lethal clone can can leave the room. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll get that at some point. No worries. Okay. Um. So, boy, so much, so much stuff here to to think about, and it seems very interconnected in almost a a circular way. Um, I think about um like Doug's Doug's starting place of the top down, you know, um receptacle um and the, the subsequent receptacles that would be necessary. Um and I don't I can't imagine a top down solution that has any uh has any hope of working and you know, it sends me going to you know maybe what we really need is the solar flare that you know takes out completely our ability to connect so that we're you know forced down to the local level. Um, but that doesn't seem good either. <laughs> um, you know, we do have to have ways to ways to connect, um, but that the, the gap between the local and the global. Um, and how we, we move through that is really stymied by nations. And it's, it, it brought me back to the thought when, when, when Factor was first trying to make its way as like a VC funded SaaS organizational tool that um, created a way for knowledge to be shared in an organization that wasn't hierarchical and for good ideas to bubble up across silos and, and gain reputational value that way. We sort of need that on a global scale that, that you know, local efforts um, to be connected, not I mean, you know, and I know this is this is preaching to the choir on kind of like basic OGM tenets, but um, the I the the ability for um, different local efforts to gain reputational steam and and you know feather outward to other local efforts. Um, without having to move up through a hierarchy as they would to, you know, like, I'm going to get a bunch of people to write to our congressman to try and put forth a bill that the congressperson is going to then have to get, you know, and it's never going to happen. And then even if you get your, 
nation on board, your nation is going to go with its own self-interest to, you know, cop and it doesn't happen. It's not going to happen, you know, up through the hierarchy and then down from the hierarchy. Um, so to, <laughs> to Gil's point about how do we who really want to do things like this um, make a difference without regard to the profit motive and scarcity and, and you know, success that's based on your sales skills and uh, ab ability to be quasi -messi messianic and, and get some movement behind you, but rather to um, create structures for idea meritocracy um, to bubble up and, and spread out. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's in, 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 and, you know, to, to Ken's, what Ken was saying, it's that that engaged conversation at the local level needs to be able to spread via a network, not by a hierarchical national structure. And um, the, the reputational piece, the moral Bitcoin um, is, is kind of key in this. Um, so yeah, and back to number one <laughs> on my list, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's all great stuff. And it, and it, it you know, you can see the, the shape of what needs to be, but not the way to get it to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's where I am today. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, uh, uh, whatever thoughts it provokes in others. Yeah. Uh, let's go Julian, Eric, Sam. So it's been a couple of weeks since I've been here and this group is so enervating that it feels like a long time. But I've been doing lots of conferences since the last meeting. Uh, first the Hackers Conference and then the Web 3D Conference in Pisa, Italy and the Augmented World Expo in Santa Clara. And then I spent this week in Phoenix, uh, both to snoop on my son, but also for meetings with the Arizona State University Innovation Lab. So I've been pr pretty much running around and I'm looking forward to the next three months because there are no conferences and no travel and I can sit down and I can really get Neo4j and Unity to earn what I'm paying for them. Uh, be before anybody gets jealous, I should mention that the the Web 3D conference was hosted in Pisa, Italy. I did it from my living room in Palo Alto. As oh, damn we, it. They did conduct it on European time. So my presentation was in the middle of the night. And the kitten was so excited to have me up during his hours that he, he brought in a mouse and was chasing it around during my presentation. And, and of course, I couldn't mute myself. So crashing and squeaking going on. But uh, that's awesome. He's a very cute kitten. So of course, I forgave him. Love that. Reality intruding. <laughs> Thanks, Julian. Um, Eric, then Sam. You, you kitty. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a little show and tell, and uh, we could talk a little about it afterwards. Awesome. So I'm going to share this one. Yeah. Show away. OK. So what you're seeing is something that was built by Stefan Kretzer from Germany. and. Um, I had some input in like this version of it. So what we're looking at is a way of navigating through data and think of it like a mini Jerry's brain where you're filtering out a lot of stuff. So here, if I go from a book to an author, this is showing other dimensions that are available. So this book also has a copyright year. And then if I want to flip the panels, I see that year I can navigate to other years. So let's go to some, and you can see the books published in that year. And I just want to go to one of them. Uh, yeah, 96. So say you pick a book, you could see all the authors of that book. And then you pick an author. Here's an author who has two books. So just thinking about this, um, does this filtered navigation help? I'm going to stop. Uh, yeah. So um, like you saw, 
the previous demo where you'd see a lot of things flying around, but does the focus help you in knowing that there are other dimensions that you could set up? So that's my question. And is this related to the zipper lists that yeah. you're working with? Okay, so this is this is similarly you could you could rotate dimensions through right. as you go. Okay. Right. Could Anyone? Stand on that question. I didn't quite understand the nature of the question, Eric. Okay. Um, like this type of visualization where you don't see all the connections, but just the ones the dimensions that are available for the cell that you're looking at. So you're looking at computer lib and you see on the right, yeah, Ted Nelson. But if you flip to Ted Nelson, you'll see all the connections from Ted Nelson. And if you flip to the year, you'd see all the books in that year. So it's a, connecting your data in multiple dimensions, but navigating in a filtered way. And is this as a reading tool or as a creation slash writing tool it could be both like okay. i'm thinking on the decentralized web if people create these structure the data structures of their data and you have a navigation so you can have multiple navigation tools on the same data this is like a graph so um and it, that demo was using graph ml so i'm just thinking long term you know like does this make sense uh, based on what I talked about two weeks ago? I'm just trying to think forward. So not derail this discussion. Yeah, right. Basically, I believe that knowledge is created one link at a time. Yeah. So you start wherever and you just do billions of them. That's right. exactly so, how you eat an elephant. Yeah. So you create your knowledge hyper core whatever i create my hyper core and we could share our hyper cores and navigate through each other's knowledge graphs and then have webs of trust with other people that's the answer yes yeah cool and, and so eric my question is this feels a lot like how rome and other backlink rich um, apps work how is it different from those because rome doesn't have dimensionality where you're switching an explicit dimension and i think that the data isn't tagged up as dimensions so we don't know that years are years in rome they're just text that happens to be a yeah. year right but but how is this different from the rome kind of view where you just see all the references in uh as you wrote as you sort of pivot through the space um, I haven't looked at Rome, but I think what I'm trying to do is take Ted Nelson's ideas forward of thinking in multi-dimensions, organizing your data multi-dimensionally, and see where that takes you. Um, if it's a, a, and if it could be done decentralized. And so I'm I'm asking that partly because there's an open source Rome project called the uh, Athens project. Uh, and I'm going to be on a panel December 1st, uh, and I think the host of the panel is the start, the founder of the Athens project and stuff like that. And it could be that extensions to Athens give you some of this functionality that you're coming at from the Ted Nelson zippered list direction. Mm -hmm. And that might, that might be a very interesting confluence. And also Athens is working more intensively on multi-user spaces than Rome is. Rome seems to keep promising, hey, we're going to do multi-user and you're going to be able to build Rome bases that are that are shared, when in fact, Athens is, I think, on a, on a death march to try to get there uh, more quickly. I don't know how much of that they've actually implemented, but they seem to be prioritizing that a lot. Yeah, I'd be interested in exploring that. Um, in terms of multi-writer, that is a new feature in decentralized uh, DAT protocol. So people can edit the same graph theoretically. So yeah, I'm just thinking how, how to take this forward. Cool. Um, Mark, and then any other comments on this? Yeah, oh, very go quickly, I'm going to post something in the chat. It's called alternative2.net. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, there are several hundred note taking programs, um, like 400 ish. Um, and, uh, you know, there's open source Rome they're uh, called, I don't know, Gloam or who knows what, but uh, sure. basically you and I should talk, Eric. Um, yeah, the idea is like, if there was a standard data structure for people exchanging interoperable data over the web, and then you put on top of it, whatever viewer you like. Uh, so yeah, I'm just seeing where this can go, what should be done. like. 
Ted Nelson he says, I, I just need to design it myself and build it for myself. <laughs> and everybody else will figure out that I was right later. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> that's completely wrong. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Everything Ted knows is wrong, which is a uh, okay. take on his uh, lecture. Everything you know is wrong. Right. Love okay, that. thanks. Um, anyone else comments on what Eric just showed? Thoughts, comments? Uh, Sam. And I was going to invite you in to check in as well. Lovely to have you on the call. Hey, thanks. Uh, let me at least just start by riffing on what the Eric just showed. <clears throat> um, the problem with dimensions, as far as I can see, is you have to name them ahead of time. So the problem that I see is if you have to think that much about dimensions, <clears throat> that almost, in a sense, constricts how you can navigate. And Eric, you and I may have talked about this before because you and I have uh, talked about angle bar related issues so i wanted to bring your attention <clears throat> to something you may already know this uh called data log which is based on triples and in actuality they're ba they're based on five tuples but the other two uh, values are metadata and triples allow you to basically have a very flexible data model and one implementation of it um is rebel r-e-b-l you might want to look into that one the other reason jerry i think this is interesting is because i believe although i can't prove yet, I'd have to go to GitHub, that the Athens people are built on closure. And if that's not right, then at least, you know, one of the other Rome clones is based on closure. And the cool thing about that is closure very natively adapts on top of data log. So I think they're in a position to really win versus other implementations. So I'm very uh, hopeful that they'll be able to do that. <clears throat> anyway, sorry, it was a long uh, introduction. My, my other meta comment is, I really apologize because um, I'm not yet, as many of you are, uh, yet to completely organize your week according to how you like to spend it. I still work for a living, and so uh, weekdays are kind of tough for me. <clears throat> that said, uh, I may end up saying too much now because I feel like I want to get all this in in the one appearance that I make on a very in infrequent basis. What I don't know yet, and I apologize in advance again, is I don't know whether this is a <clears throat> dialogue or a conversation or a brainstorming or a brain dumping. If we're all going, you know, kind of one by one, it feels more like a brain dumping than a brainstorming or a conversation. And I'd really like some follow up with each of you or small groups or even this entire group to actually go through that in some more detail. And I do mean uh, there are differences between each of those uh, interaction types. Where my head is these days is, and Stacy knows this, <clears throat> I spend a lot of time in something called GCC, the Global Challenges uh, Collaboration and Conversation Space on Saturdays, 8 to 10 uh, Pacific time, in case any of you are interested. And over the last four years, and you may gasp why four years, we have come to the realization that, I have come to the realization that much of what ails us is that truth has come under fire very successfully. And that teeter-totter, very precarious position that truth holds has allowed a movement towards fascism, a movement towards propaganda, a movement towards alternative facts, a movement towards distrust of media, a movement towards distrust of science. And I think that's been done rather successfully. So I think one of the things that we must in my opinion, do, no matter what initiative you believe in, is to restore some appreciation for truth. And then in that way, also restore an appreciation for critical thinking, for reasoning, for science, for the scientific process, for peer review, and to counter the multiple truths crowd by really understanding what the scientific method really represents. You know, this whole notion of my truth, their truth, subjective truth, devalues this whole notion of truth. And it's very dangerous. And I really think that that, in a sense, light workers, and I'll, I'll be very pokey here, are one part of the problem. If there's a notion that, you know, there's my truth and your truth and they're equally valid, that is a slippery slope towards really devaluing the real notion of truth. So in four years of conversation, I think that's one of the uh, insights I've really derived from uh, GCC. 
And so one of the things that I'm really on a campaign for right now is to restore a respect for truth, a respect for reasoning, a respect for thinking, a respect for real dialogue, a respect for evidence. And uh, people who have other thoughts, I really lean into those because I am not saying there is only one truth. I'm saying if there is truth to be discussed, you should be willing to explore it, be questioned on it. And if you're not willing to be questioned on it, then that's where I will actually then lean out. Okay. And so I think that where the the right we can characterize as right and the quote unquote conservative and or the fascist uh, segment of society has been gerrymandering the vote. I would like to gerrymander thought. I would like to de make invalid. I would like to devalidate sloppy thinking. And I really want to devalidate thinking that is not well thought out, that is not clear to explain, that is not simple to understand and explain to a five-year-old, no matter how complex the topic. And I know these are pokey words in conversations like this, but I don't get a chance to show up here very often. But in a sense, you know, I do want to make sure that, you know, my position is at least up here for people to, you know, uh, shoot at. And uh, I really invite engagement on this, okay? So I'm uh, open to one-on-ones. I'm open to small groups. I'm open to uh, sharing thoughts about Engelbart and Ted Nelson. Um, Ted is actually quite a big supporter of Doug's. They're very good friends. Uh, and we can have lots to talk about there, Mark. I saw you shaking your head, so hopefully that's an invitation to a conversation, okay? Anyway, I've said too much. I know you're past time, but uh, just wanted to make the most out of my few minutes here on occasion. Okay. Totally I happy to hear. You once, um, um, a good friend of Jack Park, Jack Park has tried to get me down to Palo Alto decades ago to basically attend um, your in-person things, and uh, I will try to connect with you. Um, I would just try to say that um, there are many different kinds of culture and cultural thinking. Um, science is different from art, which is different from mythology, which is different from religion, which is different from politics, which is different from economics. And there are different measures of validation to lead to the truth in each of our ways of expressing the human spirit. Sam's devices are going off. <laughs> um, and Sam, I just wanted to know when we have your attention again. Sorry, I had to get rid of the call, sorry. Okay, do you need to take that? No, I just uh, pushed it away. Mark. Okay, good. Um, I'm, I'm just curious what uh, gerrymandering thought means. What do you mean by that? Sorry, what, that? Do you, what do you mean by gerrymandering thought? Can you say a little bit more about that? In other words, uh, Republicans have gerrymandered electorate uh, um, districts so that they actually guarantee a, a majority in almost every district, right? And so they actually push aside, they basically uh, reduce the power of certain segments of society to actually represent themselves via a vote. What I would like to do in gerrymandering thought and gerrymandering thinking is to devalue and disinvalidate certain ways of thinking and certain ways of speaking and certain ways of propagandizing. And I want to make sure that there are certain standards to be held when someone is actually making a claim. And if those standards are not met, then those claims should be, in a sense, questioned. I don't mean tossed, but I mean really, really questioned. And if people are not willing to be questioned on it, that exposes the weakness of that position. So there ought to be a, uh, an ante you need to meet in order to have a voice in society. And that needs to be a sense-making ante. I know, Mark, uh, let's have conversations about this. So, yeah. I actually, in the last election cycle, invited via Facebook and other mechanisms, an open conversation, me leaning in very open with anybody who supported Trump so that I could actually understand their position. I got four takers. They're all very disappointing conversations, and I can actually talk about every single one of those. Cool. You've just opened a giant and beautiful can of worms, if yeah. that's even a, a thing to say. Yes. Um, Stacy, then Michael, and then probably we will wrap the call, but I kind of want to go back into this topic more. 
Okay. So I agree with everything Sam said, and I've actually said this before, but I really want to caution against throwing things against light workers. Okay, that's like a very big label. And what happens is you wind up putting a lot of people that had a, have a lot of indigenous knowledge, you put them off, you, you put us all in a group. <laughs> and I think we need to be careful of labeling people. Otherwise, I agree with everything you said as far as the standards. It should be set. Um, Michael? Yeah, I um, I really, you know, hear hear what Sam is, is saying and like the 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 reputational the coming back to the moral Bitcoin, the the the, the reputational uh, piece of being able to say here's my truth, you know, and here's my truth. And one of them is backed up by, you know, voluminous scientific data. And one of them is just, you know, what I want to be true and what my tribe wants to be true and damn the facts. And you don't want to see them as equivalent. Um, you need to be able to, to glance at each fact and see, you know, the rep reputational chits which might be, you know, here, here is something that doesn't have um, the science behind it yet, but has, say, to speak to, to Stacy's point, you know, a lot of indigenous knowledge that, that um, shows up across different cultures that says maybe there's something here, so maybe we should do more scientific analysis of it, or, you know, in the case of climate, et cetera. But, but, you know, having that medium, having that currency of some kind for, um, for you know, to, to, to basically record the fact that people who are knowledgeable about this subject in this discipline link to this fact. Whereas this alternative fact doesn't have that much of saying, um, creating that mechanism, which I think is something that can happen in a little bit in what Eric was was playing with. I just think that's really powerful. That's something that that I know I'm working on a lot. And, and by the way, that was foundational to Doug Engelbart's thinking. Yeah. So I, I love this conversation and want to keep going and kind of need to wrap this call, but I want to leave us with maybe a downer note just for fun. Um, I had a light bulb go on in my head uh, not, not that long ago um, that in religion, acts of faith like Jesus was born of virgin birth and was res resurrected after three days, named the catechism. And this came to me because a relative pointed to a, a bishop whose writings she likes. So I went to his website and the first essay was, hey, look at the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is a great place to start. And I look at the Nicene Creed and it's basically a recitation of the acts of faith of the Catholic religion, all of which are impossible through science or fact, all of them. They're totally like counterfactual. And I, I, the note in my head is your induction into and remaining membership in this gigantic community called Christianity in the, in the more orthodox parts of it depends on your agreeing to these non-scientific counterfactuals and accepting them as foundational truths above any other truth. And that's just part of membership, right? And now we have a whole bunch of other membership societies where there's a different set of facts that aren't the Nicene Creed that are other sorts of things that are foundational to membership. And for me, Sam, trying to reify and honor and respect science and facts doesn't attack that problem at all. And we need to find a way to melt, uh, to melt the middle so that we can enter a conversation that is replicable, experimentable, where we can test results and move towards something. And maybe we call that science in the corner. I don't know. And, I, and this is, a, again, a huge conversation. But I'm, I'm, my eyes have been widely uh, opened to the idea that there's a bunch of people for whom science and facts are merely another faith structure that is competing with their faith structure and doesn't really work. Which is incorrect. Agreed. Agreed. And, um, 
And so with that, let's uh, let's wrap this call. Uh, but it's, Sam, thank you for joining us. This has been fantastic. Thanks for letting yeah. me. Oh, love to have you here. Thanks, everybody. Let's a quick awesome cherry. call. Thanks. Quite awesome. Next yeah. Thursday is Thanksgiving. Good sooner. See you sooner. Um, next Thursday is Thanksgiving. So we'll still be doing a call. Hmm. Somebody has to have I think Jerry left. Wow. He had to go. <clears throat> we don't need him to do it, right? It's thanks. We don't. It's in, in this America. room. There you go. Well, I guess we're all in America. Kind I'll of see story. you then if I see you then. Yeah. Bye bye. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Good to see you. Sam, good. To, I'm glad you were in our show good today. Good to see you, Sam. Uh, good to listen to you. Good to see you, Sam. Thanks, everybody. Casey, we need to talk too. So uh, I would love to. I'm ready. Take care. Bye bye. All right, y'all. Bye.